Okay, so this is all uh, joint work I've been doing with Guy Thiari, who was here last year. And all the sort of all the methods and algorithms that I'll talk about at all are really due to him uh, more than me. And I've just been working on the you know, implementation. This picture um, is some picture of the zeta function somewhere. I wanted a nice cover picture, but I guess I never got around to it. And I don't really remember exactly what that picture is. But I'll have some more pictures later. So I'm going to tell you about some new computations. So let me tell you about old computations first. Um, the zeta function was first computed by Riemann uh, when he you know, had his you know, hypothesis. Um, and he computed the first three zeros, at least, by hand. And then going on in 1903 and 1914 and 1925, up to 1935, people computed a bunch of zeros by hand, uh, first using euler maclaurin summation. And then in 1935, uh, Tish March started using the recently rediscovered Riemann-Siegel formula, which was what Riemann used in the first place. So this range of t here, I'll uh, really be focusing on computing the zeta function on the critical line. So the real part is always 1 half, and t is the imaginary part. So you can see that by, so this means that by 1936, we knew that all of the zeros of the zeta function with an imaginary part less than 1468 were located on the critical line. And there were 1,041 zeros there. So the next step up was when the computer age started. And one thing I really like about this is that sort of as soon as computers were invented, you know, people started computing the zeta function on computers. So according to Wikipedia, at least, May 1949 is the birthday of modern computing. And in June 2050, Turing checked the Riemann hypothesis just a little bit further than Tishmarks had done. Um, it's, it's funny to, to read uh, Turing's paper. I mean, this this was more a major achievement of being able to use a computer than anything else, maybe. He talks about how this wouldn't have been possible at all, except for one day in June, the computer happened to be functioning well from 3 p.m. in the afternoon to 8 a.m. the next morning. <laughs> so they had trouble with their computers back then. Um, the, a few years later, there was more major computations by Lemmer. Uh, I think this is the first 25,000 zeros. <coughs> and this was in the US, in the National Bureau of Standards Western Automatic Computer. Lemmer also talks about using this computer and, and some of the troubles it had to go through to make sure it was working right. And he says there was a, a certain 200 by 200 matrix that he had computed the inverse for by hand. Or maybe he just checked the inverse by hand. And every time anyone wanted to use a computer for anything, they would first have the computer compute the inverse of this matrix and check that it gave the right answer. <laughs> so then, uh, since then, people have been continually computing the zeta function. We found more and more zeros. Um, up until maybe 1988, there weren't, I mean, there were new methods that people used. But there weren't any really major algorithmic improvements. In 1988, the Oletzko Schoenhage algorithm was published. And that made a lot more possible. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then from there, uh, Oletzko computed the 10 to the 20th, 10 to the 21st, 10 to the 22nd zeros, and, and billions more. Uh, uh, Van der Loon, I think this was probably just using the Riemann-Siegel formula, uh, verified for a lot of zeros. Uh, I think that's 10 to the 10. Uh, there was a distributed computing project which stopped in 2004. This is 9 times 10 to the 12, I think. And then in Gordon and uh, published a paper in 2004 saying he verified the Riemann hypothesis up to 10 times um, 10 to the, this is 10 to the 14, I think. Uh, 10 to the 13 zeros. 
Yeah. And he also computed the 10 to the 24th zero and about 2 billion around there. And so then last week, uh, I computed <laughs> not that many zeros, um, but the 10 to the 30th zero and about 250 near it, really, really more about 400 near it. Uh, but you need to compute a certain range to verify the Riemann hypothesis. So there's a method due to Turing that you can do all your computation on the critical line. And if you found enough zeros, you can check that the Riemann hypothesis is true in that range. So the range we computed actually has about 400 zeros, but it's a slightly smaller range where we can actually claim that our computation show the Riemann hypothesis is true. So you mean exactly the 10 to the 30th zero? Yes. Yeah, so that's, that, that's a method due to Turing. I'll talk about it a little bit. There's an, an easy way to get approximately how many zeros there are, and then you do this extra check to, to calculate exactly how many zeros there are if you have a wide enough range. Um, so this was done on a computer in, in Washington. It actually doesn't look that much different than the uh, pictures of the other computers, maybe, <laughs> except it's, it's a lot smaller. <laughs> Um, okay, here's are some of the zeros we computed, and we have a fair amount of accuracy. So the, the amount of accuracy I printed is roughly the accuracy, accuracy that I think we've computed the zeros to. So this is usually about five or six digits, usually six digits past a decimal place, I think. Sometimes we have seven, sometimes it's only five. You compute the zeta function with a certain accuracy, and then the accuracy of the zero you know, depends on how fast the data function is changing there. If it's changing very fast, then you can locate the zero, you know, very precisely. So here is a plot of the zeta function in this region. Uh, this is actually a plot of what's generally called the Hardy Z function. And, and this is what you actually use to find zeros. So this is just the zeta function <coughs> rotated um, an appropriate amount to make it re real valued. And the rotation factor is easy to compute. And when you compute it, uh, you know, you can, you get the real valued function, which you can actually plot. Um, maybe later I'll try to show a higher resolution version of the picture. So the methods of, so we haven't done that too much yet. I think here, uh, yeah, so if there's a double zero, we, we wouldn't be able to check. Uh, so we haven't found any of those. We've really only, we've been working on implementing this for a few months, and we only started re running it recently. Uh, th this really only took a few days to, to do this once we had it running. Um, I think the closest zero here is around the smallest maximum between zeros here was around 2 times 10 to the negative 3, I think, if I remember right. I'm not sure how close the zeros were. Nothing spectacularly close together. So I'll tell you the methods that are used a, a little bit. Uh, so Graham, Backlund, and Hutchinson just used uh, Euler and McLaurin summation to compute the zeta function. And this takes about t arithmetic operations to compute the zeta function at 1 half plus i t. Uh, th they were really going a step backwards for Riemann, because Riemann knew how to do better than this, but he never published his work. And so that was rediscovered by Siegel in 1930-ish. Um, and that was used by Tishmarsh later. And then the, the <coughs> breakthrough of Odlitsko, um was that Olitsko and Schoenhage came up with an algorithm that lets you compute the zeta function at many closely spaced points um, without too much more effort. So specifically, you know, from this, this t to the 1 half, the 1 half is sort of a parameter that you can vary depending on how much pre-computation you want or to do or how much storage you want to do, you want, or how much storage you have available. But you can compute the zeta function anywhere in an interval of length t to the 1 half after uh, pre-computation of length t to the one half. So this doesn't help you. Uh, this doesn't make. This doesn't help you if you just want to evaluate at a single point. But if you want to find many zeros, it's you know it's very useful. And this is what 
we've got this is what Oletsko and, and then Gordon used to find billions and billions of zeros. No, that's so that's what so yeah, so if you want to precisely count the number of zeros, that's that's what I think Backland and maybe Hutchinson were doing. Uh, but Turing found a way that you only you can do all your computations on the on the line. Yeah. Uh, Graham had a method of of the sum of the inverses of the zeros converges to some known value and Graham's method of checking with to compute the inverse tenth powers of the zeros or something like that. Um, so, so we're using a new key to the one third algorithm of Guy Fieri, which is what allows us to go further. This is really only for calculating at single values or, or values in a small interval, not on the full, you know, not on as large an interval as let's go show how it lets you do. Uh, so I'll very briefly tell you what the algorithm, the idea of the algorithm is. So what Hyari actually has is a way to compute quadratic exponential sums that look like this. So A and B are some real numbers. K is an integer. And he can, you know, the direct way of evaluating this sum would take time K, because you have to evaluate K terms. And he found a way to evaluate this basically in logarithmic time which is essentially, you know, no time at all for most purposes. And you can apply this to the zeta function. The, so the Riemann-Siegel formula looks something like this. And so we need to evaluate this, this long sum in the middle. Uh, this theta and phi there are some number, some functions that are pretty easy to compute, at least nowadays. Uh, so the, the focus all goes into the sum. So this is where the t to the 1 half running time comes from. But so we start from here. But what you can do is break this sum into many small chunks uh, that look like that on the top. And then um, ignoring a lot of calculations, you use Taylor expansions on the logarithm and on the square root to write it like this. And now you just truncate these Taylor expansions somewhere. And we're right now truncating at 18 here. The 18 isn't really important. That can get bigger or smaller um, without changing the running time. That just affects how big k is going to be. That 2 is very important. So uh, Guy actually has a, um, an, al an algorithm that runs in time 4 over 13 by taking three terms in that Taylor expansion there. And then you have to deal with cubic exponential sums, and that's much more difficult. It's not completely clear if that's practical uh, for actually doing computations, but it, it definitely has a, a shorter asymptotic running time. Um, so this is the idea, and, and it all comes down to how large you can make k. Uh, and the, with the size you can take k here with quadratic sums, you get t to the one third. Now we have a simple method of evaluating at, at multiple spots. And I don't know if anyone has done this before. Uh, if we look at the same block, um, we don't want to evaluate that sum again. But maybe we can just approximate um, you know, that exponential at t plus delta by pretending the sum is constant and just multiplying everything by e to the it delta log v. And if delta is small enough and k is small enough, uh, then you can get pretty good accuracy this way. And this is what we actually do. And, and using this, you know, we can turn you know, a single evaluation into evaluation on a range of length 40 or something like that with you know, very little additional cost. And once we evaluate on a grid of points, we do something called band-limited interpolation, which allows you to recover the values of the sum at any point in there. So oh, I wasn't going to talk about this too much. But if you like nearest neighbor spacings, we only have 400 zeros. So you can't tell much. But uh, I'll tell you how, roughly how we calculate the number of zeros in a range. 
So the number of zeros, there's this I is n of t. There's this, say, n naught of t, which is easy to understand. Some s of t, which is hard to understand. So this s of t, you would need to, you know, the obvious way to compute it would be to look at the variation in the argument of the zeta function, and then you have to compute off the line. Uh, but s of t is known to be usually small, so if you pick a spot where it's zero, there's a method of Turing that lets you prove it's zero by calculating in a large enough area. Uh, so, because otherwise there would be a contradiction with the fact that it, you know, that it's zero on average. And we've also, the main thing that we want to use this for is to try to find large values of t. Uh, so, I can show you the largest values of t. Well, I can show you some pictures of large values of t, but we're running out of time. Largest values of zeta. Largest values of zeta, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> So the largest values of zeta we found are around 4,000 right now. It's around 10 to the 27. So on average, a zeta function is much smaller. And the picture I showed you before, it's around 80 at the biggest. I'm not sure if there's, uh, yeah. There, there's some random matrix theory predictions of farmer and others on large values. But they, they, they have a few ways of predicting how large the zeta function should get. I haven't looked at that too much yet. Uh, so I'll just basically wrap up. Um, the best way to tell, say that our um, computations are accurate is perhaps to say that we haven't found any violations of the Riemann hypothesis. It seems, it seems pretty, the Riemann hypothesis seems pretty fragile um, that the z function, if it ever had a maximum um, below the real line or minimum above the real line, then that would contradict the Riemann hypothesis. And you can see that it comes very close to that very often. So Olitzko actually deliberately, deliberately introduced errors sometimes to see what would happen. And, and you always get errors. Um, I haven't found the need to do this. So here's a, a picture I made a few weeks ago of the z function, I think around 10 to the 18. Uh, I've made a few other pictures like this, and they always turn out to be errors in the code, and they're never contradictions of the Riemann hypothesis. <laughs> All right, I'll stop there. <laughs>